learn a lot, find mentors, talk about your future, and, and you know, to give you tools uh, how you can learn faster. So uh, tomorrow, we have a, a, a platform called Optamo University, and tomorrow it's going to be in Spanish, and it's going to be very interesting. So, you know, we're going to talk about glaucoma and sex. I mean, the, the amazing Gabo Lascano, it, it's... It's talking about this. I, I don't know what's gonna, what, what it's gonna be, but I think it's gonna be very fun. And because of the title, there's so many people subscribing. So I think tomorrow is gonna be great. It's gonna be in Spanish. So for those who you know who can speak in Spanish, then we are gonna be able to translate. Guys, sorry, there is some with the mic open. Please, please just mute all the mics. Francesco, yes. And Thierry, we have open mics. Please, please just put it on mute because we have some echo. Okay. Uh, so today we have an amazing topic again: fake emulsification, how to learn it fast and efficiently. Who doesn't want that, right? Because even good surgeons need to keep improving and to keep learning through the entire journey. So uh, we are present in almost every social media you can know. So please follow FACO Mentors and you know, you're gonna have a channel there to, to talk to colleagues, to talk to mentors, to talk to people from all over the world. This is the quote, this is our mantra, and this is what we love. We believe that surgeons, they're not the touched by an angel in, and in that specific moment, you know, they're gonna find the solution right away and they're gonna solve problems. No, they rise to the level of their training. So if you train a lot, you're going to be better and better. That's very important. Um, and it's an honor for me to have this amazing panel. You know, last week we had uh, Latin America and Asia. This week we have Latin America and Africa and Europe. So welcome Dr. Vito Romano from Italy, actually in the UK. Kalu Anya from Nigeria. Francisco Aiello from Italy. Ogo, sorry for it's it's hard to say the last name Terry from Cod de Ivore Costa de Marfil for for the Spanish speakers uh, Borja again with us thank you Borja, Borja for being here from Spain and Barcelona and Ladger a very very good friend from the house from Germany actually in Andorra and doing amazing stuff there in Andorra he, he's gonna tell us all about it. The approach today is going to be, as you guys know, the iceberg approach, right? We, we are used to see the surface. Right now, we're going to talk about what's happening under that big iceberg. So I'm going to do a quick introduction. Then we're going to discuss a lot with Ladger about what, how was his learning curve and what changes he saw like, during these years. He's an amazing surgeon. You're going to see it. Vito Romano is going to talk us about the pathway to learn and some tips about incision and ears prolapse. Uh, Borja is, has an amazing talk. Just wait for it. It's in how to train when you're in training, right? When you're in training, you're in a special mode. So we're going to give you tools how to do it more efficiently. Uh, Anya is going to talk about nucleus management. Francesco is going to talk about basic advices and iris hooks, very important things while you're learning. And Thierry is gonna talk about the ways how to stop a bleeding in the arterial chamber. Very inter interesting topic and we're, we're looking forward to it. What is FACO Mentors then guys? Uh, FACO Mentors is a community. It's an ecosystem in where we wanna give you the tools for you to become the surgeon you want to be. And uh, right now this community is getting larger. As you can see, we have a panel from all over the world. And every day we have a, an ambassador from every country in the world. So that's our objective to December, December 2020. We want one ambassador for every single country in the world. So I think we're, we're, we're gonna make it. And basically we're gathering today because you know whether we like it or not, this is how almost 90, 95% of uh, places in the world is teaching cataract surgery. We're teaching cataract surgery with a human being, like you can see there laying down in, a, in, in an open, uh, operating room environment that it's stressful and has a lot of things. 
Uh, we're going to talk a lot uh, about this with Latgo, right? He trained this way. I, I did it too. I think all the panel did it the same way. But this is changing. We know that in 2020, you know, there is a lot of pressure in surgery, not only surgery, but surgical education. We have economic challenges. We have even ethical issues about how we are learning human beings, especially Vito, I'm pretty sure you, you know a lot about this in the UK training, right? That's, this is very important in places like UK. And uh, also there is a lot of, of pressure in that surgical education happening in human beings. So this is how we learn. This is how we learn in 2020. Uh, we have a high pressure environment. We have time constraint. And sometimes we have to say it, we have a mentor uh, that has, uh, they don't, he doesn't have enough time. He, he's in a hurry because he has private patients or other surgeries. So Ladger, I would love, I would love to know what you think about it because you train uh, in this way and you, you are seeing a lot of changes uh, in the, last years. Well, Ivo, and hi, everybody. Ivo, thank you very much um, for participating um, or letting me participate. Um, I always love your, um, your, your webinars because they are so practical and so important. Um, but uh, I just come to the point. Um, I'm probably the oldest here. <laughs> the oldest. So the way I learned, you just mentioned it, uh, it was um, the, the old world. So I was I was lucky actually because I had a mentor who showed me everything. It wasn't every all the time um, very very nice uh, because as we all know, if you learn from a mentor and um, you are in these situation which you just described, it's it's stressful. The mentor not always have uh, a lot of time uh, frequently. Um, he has other things to do than just correcting what you're doing. So it's a very, very stressful and inefficient way to learn mm, surgery. So when it comes to the, to, the, to the first point, I think you, of course, need to um, get acquainted with all the theoretical know-how with uh, FACO dynamics of the FACO machine. Um, but then you have to start learning under or performing with your hands under a microscope. And this, this, of course, you can train without a mentor. But then, I mean, I, I, I did my training in Germany, but if you compare it, and I was lucky that they had the possibility to do, uh, to get the training, but there are many countries right now uh, in Europe where you even don't have this possibility. I mean, the, the Anglo-American countries always have been very, very structured and um, the, the, the training which you get in, in, in Spain and Latin America probably is, is uh, very structured as well. But then we've just heard it, when you come to, to Italy, you, you don't get the chance. If, when you go to many Eastern European countries, uh, you don't get the chance as a resident to, to, to try to practice. And in Germany, it's the same thing. In Austria and Switzerland, it's all the same situation. So uh, apart from getting better and more efficient in what we want to learn, I think it's just unfair. And we have to give everybody the possibility uh, to learn how to do surgery. I agree a hundred percent. And, you know, it's funny. I saw, uh, I, and, and Vito, I think can help us a lot. And also Francesco, they, they come from Italy. I saw a talk from a colleague in, in Europe telling us how you should treat the mentor so he can give you some surgery, right? And tips on how to behave to be in during residency to, to, to become a, a surgeon. And that's, that's, that's hard from some people, right? Because the dream of, of the ophthalmologist is always to become a, a cataract surgeon. But, you know, uh, I'm gonna ask them uh, further. Uh, we did a survey and look at the number. The number, it's, it's pretty big. We are more than 500 colleagues and it's in Spanish, but I'm gonna translate it to you. Uh, we we, we, and we're gonna do this uh, question to you guys. So whenever it's ready, please put it there and you can answer. Uh, but basically, I'm going to ask about the quality of teaching. And when we talk about the quality of teaching, almost 80% of people say there was a bit between bad and regular. 
even if they had a couple of surgeries, they, they, they think there's not a lot of transfer of knowledge or skills. When we talk about the number, because we always care about the number, right? How many surgeries did you do during residency? That's, and, and look at the numbers. Uh, and this is, this is people from everywhere. And uh, there is, a, if you can see there, I can tell you that probably less than 20% did more than 50 cases. And, you know, uh, Latigo, we can talk about hours about this, but are you a cataract surgeon with 50 cases? And I think there's a long way to go, right, after that. Well, we, we all know the answers. So, uh, but, but it's not the fault of the residents um, who want to learn how to do that. It's, I think, the fault of the system. And this has to be improved. And there are so many countries where structured um, education doesn't exist. And I think this is really necessary to be overcome. And the other thing is, I mean, mentors frequently, if you are lucky and have a mentor, there are, there are surgeons, they may be excellent surgeons and they may be excellent ophthalmologists, but they frequently aren't very good in educating other, um, other people because they've never learned it. And uh, there we have uh, big, big differences um, in, 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 the, in, in the different countries as well. Again, the Anglo-American countries are a lot better um, teaching uh, residents in a, in, in, a, in a different way. But then systems, the medical systems are completely different in, 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 in all the um, European countries. For example, in Germany, we do most of the um, cataract surgery outpatient clinics and private clinics. I mean, you can't teach anybody if you're teaching your private patients, uh, because if something goes wrong, you have a big problem. So you can understand um, the ophthalmologists, the surgeons, that they're a little bit hesitant in teaching um, their residents how to do surgery. So what we have to do, we really have to come up with different um, ways to, to educate um, young ophthalmologists, and I think with the modern technologies which we have available right now, there's a very, very good chance that we can overcome this problem. I agree 100%, and that's what, that's what exactly what, what we're going to talk about. So let's see, let's see the, the results here. Uh, let's see how, you know, okay, we have a 52 be, between bad and regular, and, and you know, and this is not judgmental, this is to improve, let's see how where are we and how you can improve. But we have about seventy, almost eighty percent saying that you know the quality of education it's regular and bad, and we have a sixty percent of people who do cataract, you know they do less than ten cases. That's that's very interesting, right? Uh, we have another two questions that I'm saving for Vito here because he is in the UK. And we know that he has a very long residency, but these guys, they do a lot of cases, right? They do a lot of cases during residency and fellowship. But my question to you, Vito, it's, always, it's also, can you be a cataract surgeon if you don't know how to solve complications and do anterior vitrectomy? Tell us a little bit about, about your case. Uh, we're so happy to have you here. Uh, uh, we would love to, to understand how, how things work in the UK. Thank you very much, Ivo. It's very interesting what you say. It's right, you're right. In England, they're very structured. Uh, there are seven years and you need to do 50 Ks each year for cutter surgery. Um, so you end up normally to do 350 cases during your residency. And uh, you learn also to manage your compl to manage the complication, to manage uh, the challenging cases. And uh, I think uh, the main important thing is that you have uh, your mentor that supervise you and step by step you will be able to do that to 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 learn all the all, all the different steps even the complication i think that to have um uh, to be uh, assured that you have you have to perform more or less 50 case uh, or or more uh, every six months you need um, you are you are quite relaxed as a, for this reason they don't complain i think for the length of the of the residency 
I think the, from my experience, I think if you had a good mentor, you will be a good mentor. I think you, you will pass this uh, way to, uh, to teach and uh, you will be as well um, uh, the, the, train, the trainer. And so the trainee will be a, a more relaxed to learn and uh, will have better results. I think overall, everyone can be a cutter f a surgeon. And uh, um, it's like, a, just as you said, need practice and uh, willing to do it. And uh, you will become uh, for sure a cutter surgeon. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and we agree 100%. So I'm going to go fast now because we, we want to talk about with this amazing panel and what we want and what we were talking with the Latger. And I think we need it in Latin America. We need it in Europe. We need it in Asia. We need it in Africa. So this is for everybody, right? For all the community. We need to understand and th this concept that we love about the wormhole or how to hack, how to hack time, basically. How to save time, how to save resources, how to save effort, and how to you know, have uh, better surgeons with better performance. And also, and this is very important for us, how a surgeon can keep uh, improving during his entire journey as a surgeon. We have this program called uh, the Fake Mentors Program. And we're, you know, again, if you take a picture into that QR, we can be in touch with you. We do recommend a mentor from you. For example, Anya here had a, an amazing mentor. It's a very good friend and part of Fake Mentors. Um, that is Ishtiake from Bangladesh. So the idea here is to connect you, you know, to a solution. This is basically our, the dream of our lives, and I think we're, we're going to make it happen. I'm going to say seven uh, quick, to, seven to eight quick tips so we uh, understand what we, we try to, to say here. First, if you want to become a surgeon, we need to understand what is a surgeon. And I, I joke with this all the time, right? You know, always need, need to wear a smile because to be a surgeon is like being like this guy. Okay, especially to be a cataract surgeon. Look at this guy using his two hands, his two feet, playing music. This is this is what you're gonna become, right? Uh, it's a brain, you know, <laughs> with, with two hands and two feet, coordinating and integrating. Uh, the the reason or, or or the surgeon itself have, you guys know it, you know, has evolved. Before we were like semi-gods, you know, we were we have the ability to cure eyes, and now we are all the time, you know, facing you know complex cases or complex situations. So it's not easy to be a surgeon, and you're gonna, for sure, you're gonna need to understand what a growth mindset is because you're gonna keep improving during your entire career as a surgeon, and you're gonna face complications. You're gonna think you fail but you're gonna have resilience. So failure is gonna be a teaching lesson and not an ending point. So the growth mindset for us is gonna be very important. The other thing is about training. You know, you need to train. Uh, there is no surgeon that, you know, an angel came and touched his hands and he became a surgeon. No, you need to train. You need to understand what good training is to get a mentor and that's gonna be the key. The journey is not going to be easy. It's going to be like there, climb it Everest. And for that journey, if you have a mentor, it's going to be great. You need to understand that first you're going to be competent. Then you can become good, then great. And then why not to get to be a master? But that's going to be, again, a journey. And a mentor, that's the, the reason of, of the fake mentor's name, right? The mentor is everything in this journey. And even mentors were mentees at, at some point. So you need to understand that, you know, it's going to be a journey. You need to understand you need to prepare the day before. You need to have a mental preparation. You need to have a team if you want to become a cataract surgeon. You need to understand the operating room and the surroundings. This is like your, your soccer field. You need to understand it. You need to understand the limitations, the good things, the bad things. What do you need to prepare? Uh, you need to understand the, the situation of the machines, the surgeon surroundings, the ergonomics. You need to understand that after you train, you're gonna you're not gonna pick specifically your patients in which you're gonna start. Uh, 
you need to understand about the mental preparation. We love the mental preparation and something called the peak performance state. You need to be in the perfect, you know, you, you, when you're doing surgery, there is a lot of tools that will allow you to be at the best uh, performance moment. And then again, ergonomics, ergonomics, and the afterwards. Surround yourself with good friends, surround yourself with good surgeons, record your surgeries, and at all times, you know, see what happens, try to have uh, metrics of, of what you do so you can improve them. Uh, what we did so far is we did a lot of stuff with FACO Mentors and Ophthalmo University. You can find these classes that we did with a virtual simulation in FACO Mentors or Ophthalmo University YouTube. And also, if you like podcasts, I will re strongly recommend for you to listen to these two amazing colleagues. Dr. John Ferris from the UK and Thomas Oitin from US. Uh, these are two podcasts that you can, you know, um, listen in Spotify. You can listen into the Apple uh, in the podcast uh, application on, on even in Google about what they think about how education it's coming, what it's coming, and again, uh, you know, there is many. Uh, sports fans here, Borja, you know, he's smiling because he, he's a, a sport fan. And, you know, if we can see Usain Bolt using technology to improve his outcomes, or we can see basketball players having all kinds of metrics or tennis players using every single gadget they can find to improve their performance. We can do that too in cataract surgery. So why not start learning this is a short video in, where, in which we love this concept about removing the patient outside the learning loop, right? Let's try to learn in an environment that we can have metrics, we can have a mentor, we can have a good communication, and you know there is no the, the high consequence for a patient. Let's train uh, in a way that we can have metrics and we can compare our metrics with a, uh, with a worldwide data uh, like we could do it in the in the simulator, we can do bench, benchmarking. We can have objectives and try to achieve them. And we need to understand. To find the solution, we need to ask ourselves. We need to understand what what is to be a cataract surgeon. So every everybody there who wants to become a cataract surgeon should understand this concept that you're going to be right like you know neo and morpheus in this encounter uh, morpheus is telling neo what a fake surgeon is and it's a surgeon with two hands and two feet working together a patient laying down the correct ergonomics and especially the correct mindset and the correct decision making right we love these three pillars about the correct mindset uh, the correct cognitive skills or the correct decision making and the correct motor skills on how to put your hands and how to to train how we can learn faster well how we can learn faster we're going to talk with this amazing panel right now i want to thank vito uh, for to being here ladger thank you so much too anya is here with us thierry and francesco borja of course with us so we're going to start talking about this i would like before we start with each panelist some quick um thoughts about what you think about all this introduction borja you can start well hello everybody thank you Ivo, for the kind of invitation um you know how i like the new technology that we can use uh for um training not only the junior trainees but also us as, uh, as experienced surgeons I will talk very little about uh, some things that we can use these days. I think that uh, it could be a topic of some other day because we can discuss about it in length. But um, in my five minute presentation, I will, I will discuss a few of these tips. Um, I've, I've been honored with having very good mentors. Like, like Ladger said, I, I'm, I'm, I totally agree with him when he says that uh, um, whoever has a good mentor becomes a good mentor and a good mentor is very very important i will also talk about uh, that in my in my talk and uh thanks to all these mentors i'm trying to pass on to the junior trainees all this knowledge uh so hopefully in the future uh, we can be more and more uh, mentors and we can all learn and improve in our uh, cataract surgery 
Excellent. Um, Anya, any thoughts about this introduction? Yes, I'm um, not but that when during the, um, during the survey, some people had fewer cases of anterior vitrectomy during their faculty training. I think it's a good sign somehow because it implies there are fewer cases of um, complications. So while I was in training, I had very few cases of um, capsular rent. And that also meant I had fewer cases of anterior vitrectomy. So if a resident says, I did less than 10 in my training, I will look at it from the other side. That is a good sign because there were fewer patients who needed um, anterior vitrectomy. But on the other side of learning, because one has to master what he does. So the fewer, the less mastery. But the fewer, the better the outcomes of the surgeries. That's my thoughts. Sir. Excellent. Uh, Thierry, it's great to have you here. You, you're on mute. Any thoughts about this introduction? Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Hi. And uh, so, uh, training, um, my mentor tell my, me, when you have a good, a good mentor, you can have a good, a good, a good student. So if you have a good student, you are. And I think that it's important for the student to listen clearly what what the mentor say to you. Very, very, very. Because when you will be when you will be in your in your office, when you will be in your operate room, it will be no mentor. It will be only you and the patient. That's what I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Francesco, it's great to have you here. Ivo, do you allow me one comment? Yeah, sure. Uh, because we, 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 we're talking so much about mentors right now. Um, it's a luxury nowadays to have a, a mentor. And there are many people out there in the world, and they, they, they don't find mentors and they don't get mentors. And I think we have to find solutions for them as well. And And this is um, when, when we're talking about to, 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 to learn fast and efficient, um, a, a very, very important point. I agree 100%. That's, that's our main objective here. Francesco, it's great to have you here. Hi. Hi. Thank, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me. So two quick uh, things. So uh, first of all, I had two training. Uh, the first, uh, my first training was in Italy because I did the residency in Italy. And as you said before, in Italy is not um, great the, the training because unfortunately, the time in the operating room is uh, always short, so it's difficult to find somebody that uh, wants to spend time with you and in the same uh, manner finish the list on time. Then I had my second and real training in UK at Morfield Sci Hospital, where I start. FACO since number of 50 and a rated number of 2000 in uh, three years, more or less. And my first year of um, cataract fellowship, I did almost 700 cases. So uh, I could measure the, the difference between UK training and um, training in Italy. Uh, definitely you need uh, um, occasions to, to measure your hands and to stay in theater. But also what I wanna stress is uh, that the cataract surgery is first of all in your head and then in, in your hands. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't do a surgery because you have a great hands, you have a steady hands without taking the right decision at the right moment. So uh, I remember when I was at Moorfields, I used to attend the teaching, uh, the cataract surgery, the cataract teaching with um, Brian Little that now has retired, but is famous, uh, famous worldwide um, to be a very good mentor with the great videos. And uh, I used to spend one hour every single week for a couple of years uh, listening 
his um, teaching. Uh, and this allowed me to take the right decision, the right moment. And I still remember his advices like five years uh, later. So remember, I would say to all the participants, remember guys to study, to chat with the mentors, to chat with the other colleagues and watch a lot of videos or uh, webinar like this. 100% agree. I 100% agree. I, I love the way you said it, right? The surgery is not in your hands, but in, in your brain. And I will go again to this concept about not only motor skills and how to move and position your hands, but the cognitive skills about how the decision making and the mindset skills to be in the perfect you know, mindset in that moment to, to a peak performance. And look at this, uh, this video. We love pay. this video about Look at it, Francesco. If it, it's so important for us, we we think about this brain and everything you need to control when you're becoming a surgeon, right? It's a resilience. It's how to face complications. It's repeatability. There is so many things: high focus, concentration, critical thinking during uh, during surgery. So we agree a hundred percent. So uh, we have before Vito, Vito is going to start sharing his screen. We have Luz Marina Melo that he, he you know, she, she was for us to, to translate and Zoom is not allowing us to, to do the translation into Spanish, but she's an amazing uh, mentor as well. Luz Marina, you have any thoughts about this introduction? Ah, well, thank you, Ivo. Well, I think that you nicely described the present and futuristic way of training. You touch all the aspects about training. And well, it's very different the way I got trained and the way we are training our trainees right now. Um, right now, through this pandemic, we have had the opportunity that the fellows in training had been using very, very much the, the eye simulator. And we've seen their improvement now with hands-on in patients, how it was very easily. And we've been using also, before we had the eye simulator, we have another, another dynamic simulator that I really recommend, that's the Kitaro, the Kitaro system. I think it's something you must consider and introduce into your trainings. Thank you very much, Luz Marina. So Vito, we're all ears. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Yes. So thank you Igor, again for your kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. So as you said, uh, also Francesco said, it's very important to grab every opportunity to watch or see cutter surgery because uh, uh, the situation will happen again. And uh, as you said, it's in your mind and uh, everything you like, you already saw this thing and you know how to act. Uh, in uh, I, I think since probably medical school, if you have the opportunity and you're sure that you want to be uh, an ophthalmologist because the cataract is the main operation in, uh, in ophthalmology, you can uh, really go and watch, assist the cataract surgery. You will learn the different time uh, that uh, the, uh, the different kind of uh, complication that can happen. And this is the main thing, go to the any kind of a training. And then you need to put your hand on. So you need to do your practice and practice with the cutter surgery in the wet lab or high simulator with the surgical microscope. You need to learn which is the distance, how to see this kind, um, how to approach the eye, how to move your, as you said, your feet, your hand, everything. Your ergonomics is all very important. After done that, and this is just a matter of how much you, uh, you know, how much time you put into it, and you will be faster and faster. More time you put into it, more uh, faster you will be. And then you can practice with your mentor doing cutter surgery. If you practice, uh, probably you go step by step. But um, uh, I think will not take long for you if you already did uh, a lot of wet lab. And then you can do challenging cases and then you will be ready to go. I think overall, if you have a good exposure to cutter surgery in wet lab or in theater, probably in a, it's a matter of weeks uh, that you can learn to do cataract, probably in weeks or months, but depend a lot from the number where you are exposed to. And um, I will focus today on the, um, uh, I will focus on the iris uh, in, 
prolapse. So it's quite a common complication. And, um, uh, and what's it's quite important because it can increase the postoperative inflammation, the high femur or dialysis, and increase the, the risk of posterior capsular rupture. So it all matter about the wound construction. The wound, if you, if you construct a good wound, it can be watertight, it can be uh, stand and uh, intraocular pressure very high without ice prolapse. They need to keep in mind uh, how to prevent this thing. When you approach an eye, not all the eye are, are the same. And uh, the main thing is that it's, uh, you need to be in mind, which is the distance between the, uh, the inner part when you go in in the eye and the eye is playing, what they call critical area of negative pressure. If this one needs to be far away from the iris, in a patient that is a very is a high myopic, so this tunnel can be um, a little bit uh, shorter. And probably it's convenient for you is the shorter because you don't distort the cornea. You are able to see because normally the high myopic is quite um, is quite deep camera. Instead, if it's a um, uh, hypermetropic, so the height is short and your chamber is short, you need to have quite a big tunnel. Uh, overall, it's a, we can say that the tunnel can be one millimeter, but you need to adjust according to the, to the, to the eye, to the length of the eye, I think. And uh, this is the critical. What's happened if you don't do that? Uh, if you don't do that, there is a, a, we know that there is a different pressure from anterior chamber and outside and uh, uh, you know outside of the eye. And as soon as there is a, a breach, so the water can come out and also the iris. If the iris is in this critical area, will come out and will be inside of your wound. And this can cause what we said, like iris damage and inflammation, hyphema, and then after uh, uh, all the other. Um, all the other panelists will speak about it. And um, this can be a problem even and uh, can also cause a posterior capsule rupture because it becomes everything more complicated. So uh, what to do in uh, uh, what to do in case if you fail your wood construction? So watch out intraocular pressure. Don't overfeed the anterior chamber. Uh, so remove the excess viscoelastic before that resection or lower the intraocular pressure or bottle eye and decrease the aspiration flow rate vacuum because all these things can cause a high difference in pressure and uh, between in and out the eye. Support the iris suck after. I think Francesco will speak about it. And in case they are perhaps, don't rush, decompress the anterior chamber first and then repose the iris. I think these are the few tips that are regarding the uh, iris prolapse I want to share with you. So, very, very, very interesting. Thank you very much, B. Joe. Let's see, there is a couple of questions. We're gonna leave them for, for the end. We have Perfect. a couple of questions from the audience. Thank you very much. And, and I think it's, you know, you have a very interesting uh, situation being from Italy, but in, in the UK. Um, what do you think are the good things we, we can learn from the UK system? Uh, in, in the I, I think for the UK system that the, the patient, uh, it's, a, it's kind of, uh, when the patient come in the theater, uh, they, in the hospital, they know that it's university hospital, they, they know that they can be um, had this, have a surgery by a trainee, and they accept that. And uh, this is quite the, this is the, uh, probably the main, the big step between the, the two countries. I think uh, in, in Italy or in other countries, uh, they uh, probably they they don't think the same, and uh, it's more difficult for the trainee for the trainee to you know to be confident and uh, to be. Uh, um, less stressful for them <laughs> instead. And so that's it. This is having the main thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vito. So Thank Borja, you. your next amazing title. I I'm dying to see it. Okay, so I hope that, I, that nobody <laughs> is uh, nice angry at me. <laughs> So after, uh, thank you Ivo for inviting me. Um, after what we discussed uh, about the topic, I, I came up with this idea of uh, uh, basically putting this title to my, to my talk, how to train when you're in training. And um, I, I'm gonna try to give a couple of tips on uh, very, very broad 
tips on, on, on all the things that we've been discussing, because like I said before, we could be talking about this for hours. Um, so yeah, I have no financial interests. I'm gonna be presenting some uh, programs and things that I have no interest at all uh, on. Uh, this is just a, a quick slide. Uh, this is how the uh, training to become an automologist in Spain uh, is. It basically takes about 11 years uh, to complete the full training with the last four years uh, as a resident. And uh, uh, in those four years, you're supposed to be learning every single thing about ophthalmology, uh, about every single te surgical technique. And like we said before, there's a lot of time constraint. So what we're doing now, what I believe we're doing now with our junior trainees is basically teaching them how to swim like this by throwing them in the, in the swimming pool. And I think that we should change that. I think we uh, we've been through that road and uh, we know how painful it is and we know how unnecessary it is sometimes. So I think we should change that. So what some of the key points that I think are important for learning or even training cataract surgery are basically these four. Uh, learn the basics about the surgery, especially when you're uh, a young uh, trainee. Mentorship, we've discussed a lot about it and I'm gonna give a, a couple of uh, thoughts about that. We have also mentioned that uh, practice, 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 practice. That is the key to become an excellent surgeon. And the last one uh, is, uh, I think, is becoming more and more important. And I think that Paco Mentors has a lot to, to say about uh, this is pass the knowledge on to the next generation. So the basics, we need to learn how, how why and what uh, cataract surgery is. And uh, like uh, Francesco said before, you have a lot of resources these days, thankfully, um, to learn all the tips, all the, all the steps about cataract surgery. Obviously, if you are lucky enough to have a mentor or even a coach, I'm gonna talk about this distinction later, uh, that would be excellent. But if not, at least you can assist surgeries, you can read books, you can watch videos. There are lots of uh, channels on YouTube with lots of excellent videos. There are uh, plenty of platforms about uh, specific types of surgeries. Or you can attend webinars like this in which uh, we discuss about our uh, pains and, 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 and successes uh, in surgery. Some of the common mistakes, these are not all of them, but I thought these, they are quite important. Some of the common mistakes we should avoid when we're training are thinking that quantity is better, is, uh, should be over quality. I also, uh, I did a fellowship in, in, in the UK and I know a, lot, a little bit about the, what the Francesco and and um, I was this talking about earlier. And uh, yes, they, they do have a lot of numbers, but uh, how good are these numbers? Uh, because numbers are not so important, especially at the beginning. Uh, you have to learn the technique, uh, uh, the good technique before you move on to um, uh, having more and more numbers, adding up numbers. Also another mistake, the faster the better. We see all our, uh, senior uh, surgeons when we are young and uh, they do cataract surgery in 10 minutes uh, somebody can do it in seven minutes somebody can and it's kind of like a competition and we think that we can do that that's a huge mistake speed comes with efficiency the more you do something the less time you spend in uh, not important things so i i when i will say this when i did my first cataract uh, case it took me 45 minutes to finish i was sweating and now I'm doing my cases uh, in roughly 17, 18 minutes. I don't get um, impressed with speed. I'm not obsessed with speed. I'm, not, I'm more obsessed with trying to do things properly. And, the, and this is a big one. We should always know our own limitations and we should increase the level of difficulty of our cases as we grow as surgeons. This is not only for the junior trainees, this is also for senior surgeons. We should never do something that could jeopardize our patient's safety. Mentorship. Uh, we could be discussing about this all day. Uh, these are, mentorship is not just training. Mentorship is giving motivation, giving piece of advice, uh, supporting our mentorees, obviously coaching and giving them directions. Right now, what are we doing? We are doing this. We're just, we just think, that uh, by teaching them how to do surgery, that's enough. We are good mentors, we can put our, our medal on. And I don't think this is the case. Um, but when we focus on cataract surgery, uh, on training per se, 
we should kind of like uh, have this in mind. I think we should be giving uh, uh, an increasing level of autonomy to our train, to our mentors, to our trainees. Uh, I would recommend doing a step-by-step -step, uh, teaching, uh, starting from the back. This was something that I put for a presentation about uh, training in Spain. I, I said, okay, what we should try to do, uh, we should try to uh, allow our first year residents to start like by doing some minimal uh, uh, movements in the eye. If you are lucky enough to talk to have uh, the IC surgical simulator that like we do in our uh, institution, uh, we can you can spend a minimum flight hours like uh, pilots do before you actually do real surgery. This will it's not a perfect um, uh, tool, but it's very useful because you acquire all this necessary finesse to navigate inside the AC, and you are more less likely to to have complications. The, the only the main problem is that it's very expensive. The second year residents could be doing uh, some steps of the surgery. Uh, we're lucky that the cataract surgery is very well um, step organized uh, surgery. So you can start with iron implantation maybe and, and, and viscoelastic aspiration, then move on to the incisions, capsular axis and so on and so on. And then if the trainee surgical skills are good enough, uh, you, the, a third or four year resident can do uh, full cases, either supervised or unsupervised. As a mentor, we should always keep in mind that we should be flexible and um, move uh, together with the trainee surgical skills. So nobody, no, nobody is the same as the other person. So we should move with them. This, would, this, would, uh, this is a good mentorship and good training. The third point would be practice. Practice, practice, practice. We know that practice makes perfection. And um, the more you practice, the more natural, skillful, swift, and steady your work will become. And this is very, very important. Uh, uh, sometimes I, I was told by, a, by a, one of my mentors that uh, for improving the movements, the, 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 the fine movements in my non-dominant uh, hand, uh, I could be uh, uh, cutting the, the, the fish uh, with my left hand. Uh, if you do this at home with very simple uh, tasks, you will definitely improve your non-dominant uh, hand and that will help you in your surgeries. Uh, what resources we have? We, I just put here a few of them. We, all, we, we obviously have wet labs like uh, with porcine eyes, even with uh, human eyes sometimes if you're lucky. This is a, a picture of one of our resins in our wet lab in uh, Barraquer. You, can, you also have some dry lab, um, very useful tools like the eye lab. Uh, uh, here you have the information on that. The, these are real pictures of the device. And it's, it's a very, very useful tool uh, for you to practice uh, capsular exit. You can even do this. If you look at the, if you go online, you will see that this is a small box and you could be doing this while you're watching TV. It's very useful and it's about practice, practice, practice. And you will become better and better with your capsular exits. You obviously have the, the IC simulator. This is the simulator I'm most familiar with. We have it at our institution and I also uh, used it in, in the UK. Uh, these are a couple of pictures. There are lots of uh, videos on, on, on the internet in which you can see all the, the um, videos of the, of the exercises you can do. This is not like real surgery, I know, but it helps a lot. It, it even helps for uh, those trained surgeons who have been out of practice for some time uh, to regain those skills that they have lost. Uh, imagine after, I don't know, broken, breaking your arm, uh, you're a little bit tight. You can use this before you do uh, safe uh, surgeries in, uh, in your patients. And there are lots of uh, training handled on programs. Uh, I, I put here a couple of them, which uh, I, uh, maybe the most popular ones are those in India. Uh, the, here are some that I could find on, on the internet. Uh, most of them, are, or almost all of them, are based on uh, the surgeon's uh, skills, and uh, you can they go from two weeks to eight weeks. Um, I've, for what I'm, I've heard from some colleagues of mine who have tried them, um, yes, you can do lots of cataract surgeries or lots of steps of cataract surgeries, but you don't get a real uh, training or a real mentorship. I don't know if anybody has any comments on that. The one that I'm familiar with, oops, sorry. The one that I'm familiar with is uh, this one in Brazil, Feco Lab. Uh, Fabiano Brandao, a very fr uh, good friend of mine who uh, we did uh, residency together, has put a very nice hands-on program in which he teaches cataract surgery 
under supervision, uh, starting from the back and, 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 and step by step. And he only, the, the surgeon only moves forward if he acquires the necessary um, skills to become a good surgeon. Here, uh, if you want, you can have some information on this here. And the last one, the last one is, is not a, uh, something that we should like just discard. I think it's very important. We've discussed about this. Uh, those of us who have been lucky enough to have a mentor uh, should be passing on that knowledge onto the next generation. We should not do to others what they did in this case, not do to us. Um, there are some places in, especially in Europe in which um, senior ophthalmologists um, are afraid of, of, of losing cases because maybe the countries are small or maybe um, they don't want anybody to become more uh, popular than, than, than them. And they basically uh, put it very hard for, for their uh, trainees and their mentee, mentorees. So I think we should avoid that. We are in the 21st century. We are, not, we st we are still teaching like we did in the 19th century. And uh, now we have a responsibility to our, towards our junior trainees and we should be creating groups like uh, FACO mentors for standardiz and standardizing training and, and also growing this, this, this feeling of a mentorship that is so, so necessary in so many uh, countries. Here's my email in case anybody wants to contact me. I will be very happy and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. As always, uh, you know, many amazing concepts. And I think the key here is you're showing so many different uh, ways because we have people here commenting that in their country, you know, they don't have uh, the capability or they have, uh, you know, train centers far away. You showed so many different resources. I think the key here is to understand which of these, those resources are efficient, are fast, they have a good mentor, and they also have people who are passionate and willing to teach, actually, right? Because, you know, we have to be completely honest. It, it could also yep. be like, like a business, but there's a lot of people so passionate out there to, to teach. We just need to connect the dots. Thank you so much, Borja. Amazing, amazing things. Um, right now, I have a, a very interesting video from Anya, and I'm going to start, uh, you know, I'm sharing the screen and I'm going to start whenever you want, Anya. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Today, this surgery was just done today, a few hours ago. You can play the video, please. Yes. It's right. Yeah, I totally agree with what Boha said. It's not about the numbers. It's about the quality. It's not about the, the speed. I do not believe in speed. This should be about, just about 10 minutes, nine point something minutes. The total surgery was about 15.26 minutes. So nucleus delivery, as it did, took most of the time. After the capsulorexis, I think I, I will agree with every other um, panelist that the nucleus delivery is now the challenge before us. And it is not an easy challenge because it's only at this stage that there is ultrasonic power being released in the eye. And with release of ultrasonic power comes energy, the heat, which is what we do not want to damage the cornea and the telium. So in my mind, like the uh, Vito said, surgery starts from the mind first before it comes to the um, to your skills. So what is in your head comes out in your skills. Even if you have good eye coordination, it may not be much. So in my mind, I tell myself, first of all, protect the cornea. At this stage, I will agree with no uh, no speed. Take your time. You don't have to be um, in a haste to finish and go to the next patient. So when I'm doing my nucleus management, I do not have in my head, next patient, get next patient ready. No, I try to avoid that. So what I did here was to do what I, I have always thought was necessary. Hydroxypropyl metacellulose. 
whenever heat is produced in AI, it follows that there should be coolant. The BSS we use is such a coolant, but the BSS is not enough because it doesn't coat the endothelium of the cornea. So I have in my head one quadrant hydroxypropyl metacellulose, one quadrant HPMC, one quadrant HPMC. So I'm carefully going in to make sure I divide the nucleus into manageable fragments. But each division, both each division comes with um, refilling the anterior chamber with um, um, hydroxypropyl cellulose. This is because I want, I'm just putting the SPMC now, I want the endothelium to be coated back again so that every manipulation I'm doing in the eye, I'm too sure the eye is safe. The setting at this stage in my Alcon um, Laureate machine was power of 35%. And um, I had to put it on, um, um, the aspiration uh, flow rate was 30, 30, why the vacuum was uh, 450. So the power was low enough, but still, I didn't want to take chances. This turned out to be a very soft contract, so I had to be extra careful with what I was doing. So even with low settings, it's still safer to do, in my mind, what I call one quadrant HPMC. Each quadrant manipulation, please refill the anterior chamber with HPMC. The, 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 the advantage is, you have your divisions all done, but then the endothelium is well protected. So I finished the divisions and I'm refilling the anterior chamber with hydroxypropyl cellulose again. I want, like I mentioned before, whenever there is heat in the eye, it's also implied there should be a coolant. BSS is a coolant, no problem, but it does not coat and give a barrier protection to the uh, corneal endothelium. So whenever I engage one quadrant, okay, this was just done today. I tried to edit it as much as I could before sending it over to Evo. It's okay, I'm trying to clean up one quadrant now. You want me to go faster? You can, you can make it faster, yes. Okay. Okay, so one quadrant is done. I refill again with hydroxypropyl metal cellulose. So whenever a quadrant is emulsified, I assume in my mind patient safety first. I come out again, refill with hydroxypropyl metal cellulose now. I could be wasting time in this. I agree with what uh, Baha said. It's not in the numbers, it's in the quality of what has been done. The, 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 you could do 50 in a day, it's okay, if you have the strength if you, and you have the patience, but what of the quality? So I pick the, the third quadrant, emulsifying it carefully. Like I mentioned, it was a soft cataract. I thought it was um, harder than this. So back again, I have to refill again with hydroxypropyl metal cellulose. I think I did this more than 10 times, just within a space of the period of the surgery. And I, I want to mention that the rest of the surgery from the incision, and go to cortical cleanup and the uh, intraocular lens implantation and the visual elastic cleanup didn't take up to basically four minutes or so. But the major time I spent in the surgery was in this I am doing nucleus management. And I think when um, we are passing on information to, to the younger generation, we need to let them know is not in the numbers. Uh, Professor Istiak 
made sure that entered into my head. Always take your time and get it right. And finally, I'm done with the surgery now, with the, sorry, with the nucleus management. And um, the next was to do the cortical cleanup, which didn't take much time. And before we knew it, it was all over. So my take is simple. Safety first, before we talk about speed. Speed should come with efficiency, just like um, uh, Boa said, I, I still agree with him. Then it's not in the numbers. Even if you do one in a day, be satisfied with that one. I want to revisit what I mentioned about um, anterior uh, vitrectomy. If one is careful, obviously, there will be less chance of capsular rupture. And it's possible in a week, you may not have done anterior vitrectomy. So in one side of it, So carefulness with tissue management, carefulness with the manipulations inside the eye will give us less complications. And I guess that's why it is scored fast, but most importantly, efficiently. Thank you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anya. It's, it was very you know, descriptive and it was, I think it's one of the most important steps of FACO. Thank you very much. And there's a lot of people with many, many tips and also, um, Ladger, do you have any, any comments? Also a great surgeon, you know, when you're learning, especially when you're learning uh, nuclear extraction. And we're gonna make Francesco getting ready, so he's next. Well, I think it, the, the, the biggest complication, I mean, not uh, everybody knows is um, the rupture of the posterior capsule. And when this happens early, then uh, you may have a problem. And a situation like this, uh, fortunately, we, we don't have that frequently. And to learn how to manage a situation like this uh, is especially challenging. Um, and if you don't do things right, then you can end up uh, having a catastrophe. And um, the, 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 the problem is, even if you do the surgery together with a mentor, then you are immediately under stress. So I really would um, stress my, my, my basic um, comment in the beginning that we have to apply modern technology to train these situations better. I think this is very, very important. Completely agree, Ladger. So Francesco, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you again. Uh, so uh, talking about speed, I always had something in mind, like uh, if you want to go fast, go slower. What, what, what do I mean with this? Uh, if you want to try to accelerate the, uh, the surgery and you are in doubt if to use or not Vision Blue, for example, don't try to find the shortcut. So skipping this step, because this will make you uh, in trouble. So just try to go a little bit slower doing all the proper step at the right time and you will end up the surgery with no complication and potentially faster than not having using these extra steps so um, i will start my presentation and um, i would say thanks to lisandro to helping me to to show the, the slides uh, with some uh, tips if you if we can go to the next slide. Thank you very much. So this is something that I learned in, in UK. Uh, be ready for your first time and follow the five P uh, rules. There's an animation so you can go ahead. The five step, the five, five P uh, rules is proper preparation prevent poor performance. So try to be ready for your first uh, surgeries. And what has helped me a lot was this kind of simulator, the IC, I have no financial interest, but I remember spending uh, every day, one hour for a couple of months, every single day uh, doing this, uh, trying to, to do some movement inside the eye in the simulator. I, I found this uh, simulator really good. Why? Because uh, it does help your mentor to trust you. Because the first time that uh, a surgeon <clears throat> or a, a, a resident um, start doing the, the surgeries, what scares the mentor is how fast or 
um, not uh, very um, good and precise the, uh, the instruments they go inside the eye. So this made the, the mentor a little bit uh, scared. So um, the threshold to swap the surgeon can be quite low. So the simulator does help to uh, increase the dexterity to use the hands and to move uh, the instrument inside the eye. So the first time, all the uh, movement needs to be very, very slow and precise. We can go to the second. So some general tips. When we have this large audience, it's always difficult to, uh, to find the right target to, to give tips. So I included some very basic tips and then we will see something a little bit more uh, difficult. So uh, first of all, record your surgery. This is a must. If you don't record your surgery, you can learn from yourself. You can definitely learn. You can understand the mistake you make uh, and you will make pro probably uh, at the second surgery as well. So do record your surgery and ask your supervisor to review the video with you or review the video with even with your colleagues at the same level or just one year uh, older than you, it, it can help. So um, watch other videos and YouTube is a great resource. I remember uh, I arrived in UK in 2011 and YouTube was just at the beginning with the surgical video. Uh, videos, but uh, I spent a lot of time looking at these videos and I learned a lot. Uh, as I said before, cataract surgery is first in your head before then in your hands. So take the right decision. Uh, and um, in brief, you have to think, think, think um, when you do your, your surgery. So continue, uh, continuously think what I'm doing, what I expect from this uh, movement and what can happen. Uh, and also uh, remember to be nice with your supervisor because he's putting a lot of effort and uh, also um, it needs to be brave to let you uh, stay inside the eye uh, by yourself. Next, uh, something really uh, easy, but the uh, patient position is the most important thing and also the surgeon position. So if you are sitting uncomfortable, uh, it's very difficult that you can uh, end up the surgery because you will start to have pain in your neck, in your back, in your arms. So, uh, and your hands are going to, to shake it at the surgery. So try to set your uh, position properly, uh, ask for help, and also try to set the patient position very comfortable for himself and remember to to say the the magic word that are chin up for me please and look at light so chin up will make the eye parallel to the to the floor and this will help the visualization of the eye and the eye structure usually i don't advise to take the uh, forehead the patient forehead why because if the um, position does move is quite difficult to go back to the original position so unless there's a um, basic um, tremor and a head tremor uh, I always advise to, to avoid it um, and know how to put your drape properly uh, I don't want to see eyelashes on the way this is the first sign of a good start of the surgery next please thanks uh, this is a funny uh, position that I used to, um, to do the surgery, uh, this is me, and is what my mentor, Vincenzo Maurino, used to call the duck position, uh, with the legs open and not underneath the, the bed. This allowed the bed to go uh, very low, and this would relax your shoulder, but also your uh, elbow. Uh, and also, I always advise not to use the arm rest, because uh, more than helping you, it does stack you in one position. And because the one of the key point of the cataract surgery is uh, the fulcrum of your instrument inside the eye to avoid to pressing on the wound and losing anti uh, fluid from the anterior chamber. So uh, having the chamber that is balloting up and down, uh, you have to tilt your instrument. And this is only possible if you move your elbows and then your wrist and then your hand. So I always advise to, to avoid it. Despite the beginning can be a little bit more difficult to have steady hand, uh, but then uh, it will come much better. 
So this is to go inside the operating room. This is one very good friend of mine, Luis Fernandez Vega from uh, Oviedo. And sorry, Vito, not to put in a picture with you. Me, Luis, and Vito, we share some training in corneal surgery at Moorfield Sci Hospital. So let's go inside the, uh, the operating room. And I do have a video on uh, how to put the iris suit. So iris suit is not difficult to put. It is more difficult to do a cataract surgery with small pupils. So take your time, do your uh, incision. I do with, with the keratome with only one grasp with the notch forceps. So one grasp and, grasp and three uh, incision. Then you can try with the phenyle intracam phenylephrine uh, to try to have a little bit more dilatation. Doesn't work in this case. Um, there are branded uh, products to dilate pharmacologically, uh, or you can put seven drops of sterile uh, phenylephrine in one ml. Then you try with the viscoelastic uh, dilatation, doesn't work. Remember before using the iris sucs to lift a little bit the iris with the viscoelastic, otherwise will be difficult to insert the hooks inside. So um, avoid to overfill with the, uh, the anterior chamber with viscoelastic, vis vis viscoelastic, sorry. Otherwise the iris will be stuck on the, uh, on the lens. I always put uh, a hooks underneath my main incision. This will stop the uh, iris to go um, into the main wood. So I, first of all, remove all the hooks from the, uh, the box. Otherwise it will be difficult to go up and down with the, your magnification. You do usually four hooks are enough for almost all cases. So you do your incision and then you put all the hooks in. Try to, to, be, uh, to standardize your technique. First of all, I remove all the hooks from the box and then uh, I do incision and hook in because if you do all the incision first, then you will lose your uh, opening. So I do the incision and then I put the, the hook. Then if you struggle as the, uh, the hook opposite to the main wound, if you struggle to find space, just remember that you can always go inside with viscoelastic, lift the uh, iris up and then it will be much easier to insert the uh, hook. Uh, and then the last tip will be uh, try to engage the iris with the all hooks first and then you uh, pull the hooks um, circumferentially. Uh, this means don't, don't pull it with the opposite hooks. Uh, otherwise, you will end up with the cut pupil uh, and you don't want it. So you do it in a clockwise or anticlockwise. Try to be nice and doing a, a regular uh, shape uh, like a, a uh, a quadrat and uh, remember to when you then you do your case uh, and remember to remove your hooks before removing your viscoelastics this will keep the anterior chamber stable it's quite easy to remove it you um, pull it a little bit your butterfly then you push inside and then you you use your butterfly to rotate the hook otherwise will get stuck to the iris again and then you pull it and pull it you don't really need to um, hydro suturing the uh, iris uh, uh, opening, but if you want, you can do it, but you don't really need usually. And I hope this was uh, helpful somehow. We can go to the last slide, just, okay. Just uh, the last great. slide. Uh, and um, only my um, email, just in case you're, or uh, better, my uh, Instagram um, contact. Just if you want to ask me some question, you can write me uh, freely uh, there. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Francesco. It was amazing too. So many tips. I think this is going to be a class that people can, you know, because that's one of the most important things, right? We are. We have so much information now. Now the, the key here is where, where is the quality information, how to access, access that information fast. And everything is gonna be in the YouTube channel, you know, for the future. But I think people learning, you know, can come back to this class and learn many, many, many things. Thank you very much for your tips. Thank you. Just to finish, we were really very good with time. We have uh, Dr. Thierry. Uh, we had some problems with, with the slides. I don't know if you were able to send them or or you are able to share them, but we will love to, to hear from you, Thierry.
Okay, at the moment, I will make uh, my speech without slides. And I'm sorry. We have to talk about the complications, the complications during the cataract surgery. Talking about the bleeding, the bleeding inside the anterior chamber. When it's bleeding inside, you think about terrorization, but you can't do terrorization inside the anterior chamber. It will be very difficult. So we have to, to have technique to make to stop the bleeding inside the anterior chamber. One technique is the technique. Take a syringe, five cc with a cannula, a ripcroft one. Use the syringe, stop air, and put it in the anterior chamber. And you wait around one minute, washing inside the anterior chamber, and you will see a fantastic result, stopping of the sting of the bleeding. And you will continue to make your surgery. This is one way. One way is to use plastic. Put the visco inside the waiting one minute and after you wash the and you will see a stick result no bleeding and you will be able to continue your story what you have to understand is about the technique is put the liquid of a gas inside the little chamber the pressure inside increase and will be impossible for the blood coming from a vein or a artery to inside the anterior chamber. It's essentially physics. The action is the high pressure and the result is the stop. And we we'll have to, to think about when you see uh, the students when they are on stage, we can see an accident blading inside the chamber. And you can see that's why it's very important, very, very important to do to have to know what you have to do when this accident become. I want to thank uh, Dr. Ivo and all of you for listening to my, my small speech and thank you, thank you very much. God bless you. Oh, thank you very much, Thierry. It's an honor to have you. Uh, we, we want to expand this community to have colleagues from all over the world to understand your experience. And, you know, I, I think in a very short, uh, in a very short comment, you, you are giving us tips for something that is very unusual, but could be very dangerous. So thank you very much. Um, and then again, you know, uh, we, we, we are just about to finish. I just want to thank all the panel. I think today was, was a great day. I think we're learning a lot. I think we saw those numbers, you know, those numbers are something to be aware of. There is a lot of colleagues out there with the dream to become a cataract surgeon and they, they see almost no, uh, no, no, no path or, or no ways to do it. I think that's changing because of not only technology, but a good methodology, the methodology we call the wormhole. Let's try to use technology and, and a good methodology, understand how adults learn and we can learn faster. But learn cataract surgery is not only about knowing, you know, the, the technique. It's, it's about 
Well, we, we love the online mentorship. I think we, we said the word mentorship so many times. I think Lager, Ladger did a, an amazing quote about not everybody you know has the luck to have a mentor. I think with this portal and this community, we, are, we want to give everybody a mentor. We have simulation. Uh, Borja told us everything he's doing. Uh, everybody talked about not only virtual simulation, but artificialized simulation. Then there is something very important. And we, we think there is a new learning curve, but, but then you need a couple of uh, cases with human beings. That's going to be, you know, we can transfer you knowledge, but then you will need supervision for the, lab, uh, the first 10 to 20 cases. And there is also options about that. But always think about what, come, what comes next, because then you need the operating room. You need a team behind you to help you do cataract surgery with FACO. And we think the best thing we can offer you is a community or always help you, you know, other colleagues, giving you advices for cases and for everything. So we believe in this new learning curve in which the, sur the patient comes after you have a lot of knowledge. Okay, I think this is very important. I think this is one of the main conclusions of the day is try to learn everything. Now you can with technology and a methodology so that when you start with the patient, you know, you have a lot of knowledge and experience. This is how we deconstruct surgery. Fake and we love, let's, sorry about the volume. We love to take the patient outside the equation, to deconstruct surgery have a new perspective of surgery and remember the three pillars from fake commenters, right? The psychomotor skills, what's in your hands, the decision-making in your head, and also the mindset skills during surgery. Uh, as Bor has said it, we believe in, in simulation. Simulation is not only for psychomotor skills, but also to have repeatability in simulation. Remember guys, almost all of you said that there is no chance to do complications or hard cases. Well, in simulation and artificialized, you can do that. There is also something about learning in groups. We did this just before COVID with the amazing Luisa Scaff in Barranquilla, Colombia. So we had 30 surgeons from all over Latin America learning together with six stations, with artificialized, with the real um, with, with the real uh, machines you're gonna use. So we are all about learning together in something called the constructivism theory. And we believe that we're gonna have surgical ec ecosystems in the future looking like this. Learning with colleagues, learning with mentor mentors all together. As we said before, uh, simulation has been proved. You can see there a 38% of reduction of pos posterior capsular breaks in this amazing um, paper from John, Dr. John Ferris. Uh, and, and this is important. This is not only good for, for you, but for patients and even for the healthcare system. Uh, as I said before, different places, different solutions. There is a new way of doing things and prepare yourselves for what, com what comes next, right? Try to have a mentor to pick very, very good uh, those next patients, which kind of cataracts are you going to do? This is again, you know, the program just very quick. You can take a picture from the QR and follow some uh, information and we will be in touch with you. Um, this is uh, this is it for today. And I will love as, 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 as the costume of Tumblr University, I will love uh, a quick uh, comment to end from all the panelists. So Ladger, you can start. That was that was a great session, I think. It's very important for everybody, for every uh, young colleague who wants to uh, join our fantastic world. And let's just work all together that we can realize it. Thank you very much. Luz Marina. 
Well, um, thank you. It was amazing to hear everything. And just maybe to add something up that I think it's going to be very useful is that all our trainees, they have and they keep a bitácora, we call it in Spanish, it, it would be like a portfolio, like a logging. So not just recording the surgeries, just writing down the parameters. For instance, uh, we have a big patient in Excel, I could share with, with you if you want, where we have the timing, the liquids, the fluids, the parameters, the CDE they used, because you have to grow with yourself. You have to compare with yourself when you're growing up. Well, and always, because you, you cannot compare with other trainees. We have different skills, we come with different backgrounds. So the way that they can see for themselves and see how their learning curve is increasing, they can, with that graph, they, they present it also with, uh, they present the graphs uh, based upon the Excel sheet and uh, with the parameters and all, all, all those things that are going to be useful because they can record their own things, not just recording the surgery, recording their logging. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anya? Well, I'd like to say to myself and to my co-panelists, to everyone, ask questions. Nobody knows it all. Ask questions. If you find yourself in a tight corner, ask someone. Um, I still have, since I met Ivo online, we've been chatting, we've been calling each other, ask questions. And I've learned a lot from him from a distance. Um, my trainees, I keep in touch with them. I share my challenges with them. Nobody has all the skills. Nobody knows it all. So when we ask questions, we get better. I am proud of meeting Boha, and uh, what he said is stuck in my head. It's not in speech, it's in quality. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anya. Vito, a couple of words. Thank you very much, Ivo. Thank you very much to everyone. It was very, very interesting. Hold the videos, uh, hold the slides. Very, very interesting. So I think you're right. Mentor is the, is the key part and have access to this new facility. It's also a very good way to start. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for your time. It was a pleasure to have you. Thierry. Thierry? It's me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is not good. Just some I mean last words. Last words for for the entire. You know me? Yes. I want to thank everybody. Very much. And <clears throat> yeah, sorry, so the connection is is not very good. Sorry. Very uh, very amazing. Uh, and Borja, just few words. Uh, last few when words. When you surgery. Uh, make sure that one day you will face competition and you will remember what mentor taught to you and I think that is very important to have a mind. very very important thank you thank you very much thank you Jerry thank you Jerry for being here with us Borja Yes, thank you again, Ivo, for the kind invitation and thank uh, all the uh, fellow uh, um, at, um, speakers. Uh, I'm going to give a last thought to us as a community. I think we should uh, switch the paradigm of uh, teaching and learning uh, surgery and uh, stop thinking about uh, the ways of teaching uh, as they were in the last century and start thinking about the future ways of teaching and learning. We have a lot of tools that we didn't have last in the 20th century that we should definitely take advantage of. Uh, the, the next generations uh, are going to be very lucky if we put a lot of thought and a lot of love into, into this. Thank you very much, Borja. Are we 100 percent? Francesco? Uh, so thank you very much, Ivo, for this opportunity and to all the panelists. The last tips that I will say, don't think that uh, if you had no complication after 100 or 200 cases, uh, you are a good surgeon. I always think 
this year I'm a better surgeon than last year. So it's um, completely, um, it's always a, a process, okay? We can always learn from ourselves, for we can always learn from others. So every year I say, I mean, I, I'm amazed about this thing. Uh, last year I, I thought that I was a good surgeon, but this year I'm definitely better than last year. So um, keep keep learning, okay? Thank you. No, oh, thank you for the time. It was a pleasure to to have you here with us. People are very very happy. Amazing comments. Uh, so let's hope to to keep doing activities like this, right? Uh, I'm gonna keep pushing and invite you guys for for many many activities. So see you guys soon, okay? Yeah. See you. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.